All right, so in chapter two, we were looking at the, the atom and then the structural differences between the, the different elements. So what makes nitrogen versus oxygen versus fluorine, any of those different elements, um, and the, the subatomic particles and the atomic mass and things like that. In chapter three, we're going to sort of continue with that. We're going to continue looking at the elements, continue looking at the, the differences. Um, but in this case, we're going to be more focused on the, um, the electrons specifically. Those are going to kind of be the, the particles that are the, the most interesting in terms of chemical reactions and forming bonds and things like that. We'll see that the, the electrons are the one that are really doing um, all of that work. Um, and then throughout this process, we're going to get a better understanding of the, the periodic table, specifically how it's set up and how we can use a periodic table as sort of a tool to get a better understanding of a specific element based on its location on the periodic table, um, as well as the, the properties um, of those elements and just their, their behavior in general. Click through. Um, and in class, I had you do this little activity where you're given a couple, you're given a series of different little note cards that contain specific pieces of information. Um, and the information we can see on here include things like a shape, a number, um, a color, and then just a size. And I asked you to just sort of create some sort of system on how we could uh, just organize those different pieces of information. And ultimately, we would wind up something like this. Um, and you can see as we go through, the, the number is increasing. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, we're missing 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14, missing a couple. Um, that's going to be similar to the atomic number. Because if you look at the, the periodic table, the way it's set up is the atomic number is just always increasing. We start with helium or hydrogen, excuse me, on the, the top left, helium number two on the top right, and we continue lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon. So the atomic number on the periodic table is always increasing. Um, and then also, if we look through here, going down any one of these rows, we're going to see the same sort of properties repeating. So if you pick any of these, for instance, the, the middle one, we can see triangle, blue, and medium. Move over one uh, column, we can see pentagon, red, and small. So we're seeing the, the same properties repeat throughout. And because of that, if we have blank spaces like we do in a couple places here, we could actually predict what would go in those spots. So we can see the atomic number, we're missing 7, 11, and 15. And then in terms of the, the shape, the color, and the size, it's just going to match up with the rest of what we have in those columns. So for this one, it's going to be circle, 11, green, and extra large, square, 7, purple, and large, and then line, or yeah, line 15, red, and uh, extra small, or orange, and extra small, small excuse me. Um, and this process, what we're looking at here, the way we're going to connect it is um, basically what Dmitry Mendeleev did with the, the periodic table, except for he was, of course, working with the, the elements rather than just some generic pieces of information on um, a series of note cards. Um, but what's actually interesting is the way he set up the periodic table, like I talked about, the atomic numbers always increasing. But the, the periodic table itself, if you look at it, the reason we have some of these sort of jagged shapes here um, we're missing kind of a, a block at the top. If you look three, four, and then we skip across to five here, six, seven, same thing, 11, 12, skip across 13, 14. Um, the, the reason the periodic table is set up exactly like it is, is because just like these note cards, we see the, the same properties within these groups, within these columns. That's going to be the, the same thing we see with the, the periodic table as we go down any of these groups, any of these columns up and down. Those elements aren't going to be identical but they are gonna have very similar chemical properties and that's why we have it grouped this way. So for instance, um, we'll see that group one here. So just this first column with the exception of hydrogen. If you look, all of those are red because they're gonna behave very similarly. The same thing, this second group here, all of them are that same sort of orange color because they're gonna behave similarly. Group 18 all the way on the right-hand side. Again, all of these are gonna have similar properties to one another and that's why we're representing them with the, the same color. Um, it's not a perfect periodic table in here because if you look, we've got kind of green, sort of a jagged, weird sort of staircase almost for the, the yellow. Um, we'll go through the, the rest of it, but the, the main thing with the periodic table is recognizing that any of these groups going up and down are going to have similar chemical properties, and that's why it's organized the way it is. And then similar to how we were actually able to predict what those missing spots were going to be, um, when Dmitry Mendeleev first uh, sort of developed the, the periodic table, the, the periodic table at that time, because this was in the, the mid to, to late 1800s, 
wasn't exactly like we see here. It had the same sort of general format, but it wasn't perfectly the same as we have here. It's been developed a little bit over time. And part of the, the reason for that is because at that time when he was developing this periodic table, there was actually certain elements that hadn't yet been discovered. So with the, the periodic table, um, we're going to look at silicon and germanium, but he actually did the, the same thing for aluminum and gallium. Um, so the, the way he had his periodic table set up was the, the same where we had the same properties in the, the same group. Um, so if there was a blank spot in the, the periodic table, let's say for germanium, for instance, but we knew ca uh, carbon, we knew silicon, we knew tin, we knew lead, and we just knew that there was an empty spot. So he knew that there was some element that belonged there. We just hadn't yet discovered it. So what he was actually able to do is use the, the properties of these other elements to estimate what germanium was going to be before it had even been discovered. So he had an understanding of how these uh, properties repeat throughout these elements, saw that there was a missing spot here, and was actually able to predict what the, the properties of that element would be. So if we look at the silicone, if we just go back at the silicone versus germanium, Silicone is here. Eka silicone is just going to be his prediction for germanium. So it's just referring to below silicon. Um, whereas the, the germanium one is going to be what the, the actual element is after it was discovered. So again, this occurred in 1871 prior to germanium actually being discovered. So Eka silicone is just Dmitry Mendeleev's um, prediction on what that element is going to be. And if we look at some of the, the properties, um, he did a very good job because he understood that the, the properties of this element is going to be similar to the, the other elements within that group. Um, so the atomic weight, pretty spot on. The density, essentially the, the same. Valence, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but it's essentially just how many electrons are there in the, the outermost um, electron shell, essentially. Melting point of, he just estimated that it was going to be high. He didn't have a specific number but close to a thousand degrees C is going to be extremely hot. Um, so that makes sense. And then some of these other ones, um, if we look at like the, the form of oxide or the form of chloride, that's just going to be the, the, the compound that forms when we combine this element with either oxygen or chlorine. And the important piece here is to note that if you look, we're combining one of these atoms with two oxygens, the same thing with germanium. Got the same thing going down uh, here with the, the chloride. We're taking one of those um, hypothesized eka silicone atoms and combining it with four chlorines. And then once germanium was actually discovered, we saw that that's the, the ratio that they combined. It. So even though he was a little bit off with the, the density of these substances, because he knew the, the chemical properties of this element, he knew how it was going to combine with oxygen. So he knew one of these atoms was going to combine with two oxygens. The same thing, one of these atoms was going to combine with four chlorine. And that's actually what we see with the, the germanium. Um, and then the, the final one here, the, the boiling point, he just said it was going to be less than 100 for the, the chloride, and it was actually measured at 84 degrees C. So he had a, a very good understanding of these elements, of these properties, how they repeat. And when he saw a missing spot in the, the periodic table, he was actually able to, to pretty effectively predict how that substance would behave, even though nobody had yet discovered it. Um, and then, again, this was silicone versus and germanium. So he was kind of basing it off of what he knew about silicone to estimate this spot. So that's what he's referring to as eka silicone, what it eventually became known as germanium when it was discovered. Um, but he also did the same thing with gallium or a similar thing with gallium, excuse me. Um, he saw a missing spot in the, the periodic table, but what he knew about aluminum, he was able to predict how that, that substance would behave. And then with these elements, um, the, the next slide is gonna give you a little bit of a breakdown on how they're produced. Um, but if you look, this is just short, sort of showing the, the, the distribution of those elements. And note that this is a logarithmic scale. So each increase in one of these numbers is going to be a 10 times difference. So if you look, hydrogen and helium are about one unit difference. Um, so that means there's going to be about 10 times as much of the, the hydrogen in the universe as there is the helium. And we can see in general, it's just a decrease in the abundance of these elements just as they become heavier. Um, and then depending on how familiar you are with the, the Big Bang and some of the other processes that occurs in stars, you may be familiar with how some of these elements are actually formed. Um, so if you look, these different colors just represent the, the different ways these elements are produced. Um, 
but in general, we're not going to be focused on this this aspect too much. We're just going to be um, recognizing that there are different uh, processes that can create these ones. Um, some of them, like the the Big Bang, uh, and then in the the center of stars, there's just high pressure, high temperatures, and we can actually take some of these lighter elements and essentially just sort of combine them into a heavier element. Um, sometimes when the the stars are dying or exploding. Um, that process does something similar where it sort of just ejects different elements out into the uh, the universe. Um, but note that the highest we go here is 92. So we're missing 93, 94, 95, the rest of this row. And then we're also missing the entire bottom row of the sort of the main block of the periodic table um, because every element above uranium is actually gonna be um, man-made. So anything above uranium is known as a trans-uranium element, and it's meaning it's going to be produced in a, a laboratory, so it's not going to be naturally occurring. And then these two here that are kind of not really fitting into this table um, are naturally occurring, but they're in extremely, extremely small quantities, and they're extremely, extremely rare. Um, so that's why they're just not included in, like the, the rest of these here. But looking at the um, the breakdown of the, the different elements in the, the human body, we, we talked about it a little bit in chapter one, just very briefly. Um, we saw that oxygen makes up the, the largest par portion of the, the human body by mass. Um, but we've also got carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and then a whole bunch of others mixed in. So you can see these are known as trace elements because they, they will be present, um, but they're going to be present in very, very small quantities. So if you look, we've got two, four, six, eight, ten. About 20 or 21 elements that are going to comprise just 4% of the, the human body. So they're all going to be a very, very small quantity, especially compared to the, the, the more dominant elements. Um, but you can see here, if you want to pause and kind of read through each of these individually, you can see what some of the, the uses of these different elements are. Um, so in bones, calcium, of course, is going to be important. In blood, iron um, is what actually helps the ear with is made up of the, the, the hemoglobin, allows for the, the transport of oxygen through the blood. Um, with the, the ones up here, sodium, or sodium, excuse me, Na, potassium, chlorine, calcium, iodine, um, nerves and control. So when you're hydrating, so it's, for instance, Gatorade, the electrolytes, the electrolytes are actually referring to, to things like these because they're gonna allow your body to actually um, transmit those nerve signals a little bit better. Uh, so that's why sometimes when you're cramping, that's part of the, the issue. You're low on these electrolytes. You're not having your, your muscles fire those nerve signals correctly. And then with this one, we look, it's going to be a, another sort of breakdown of the, the human body. Um, but pay attention to the, the unit here. So this is going to be percentage by mole. So this is just referring to if we counted all of the, the different atoms in the, the human body and just took the, the number of each of them. Hydrogen is going to make up by far the, the most, followed by oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. And then again, we got a whole bunch of other ones just making up those, those tiny percentages. And then this is just another visual of the, the first slide we saw. So different than this one, but similar to, to this one, 65% carbon, 18% or 65% oxygen, excuse me, 18% carbon, 10% hydrogen. Um, basically what we're seeing here, so these ones are rounded a little bit different, but they're the, the same thing. But the, the previous slide, we've got very different numbers. So it's hydrogen 63% versus just 9.5% in this case. And the, the reason for that is going to be based on how we're sort of taking these percentages. So these are going to be percent by mass, whereas these are going to be percentages by mole. So these ones by mole are essentially just counting each atom the same and just looking to see simply how many atoms of each of those elements we have versus the, the total amount of atoms uh, combined. Whereas this one, where we're looking at the, the percentage of the mass is now factoring in that hydrogen, even though we'll have a whole bunch of those hydrogen atoms, they're going to be extremely, extremely light. Um, whereas the, the oxygen, if we go back, we'll still have a good amount uh, portion, so about 25% of the, the atoms are going to be oxygen. Um, but because those are going to be much heavier than hydrogen, that's going to make up a much larger percent by mass. So with these, we're just essentially um, recognizing that we can take the, the percentage of these in a couple of different ways, and we're going to wind up with a couple of different numbers.
uh, because again, with the, the percent by mole, it's essentially just saying for every 100 atoms we have, 63 of them are going to be hydrogen, 26 are going to be oxygen, nine of them are going to be carbon, uh, 1.25 of them will be nitrogen, and then we'll have just the fractions of the rest of them. Whereas in this case, where we're looking at percent mass, now it's telling us if we have 100 grams, 65 uh, grams of those are going to be attributed to oxygen. 18 grams of that is going to be carbon. Uh, and then the same thing for the, the remainder of these. Uh, but when we're looking at the, the periodic table again, we're going to have a couple different terms we can use depending on if we're thinking about the, the rows going across. Those are going to be what are, we, what are known as um, periods. And I like this image because it gives us the, the different colors for the different periods. But what I want to point out here, because the if you think about it, if all of these are green or all of these are blue, um, you may expect that since we're, we're coloring them the same, we're going to see similar chemical properties um, throughout. But that's not going to be the case. We'll see with the, the next slide, we'll have similar properties going up and down. But the, the horizontal rows, the periods as they're known, um, aren't going to have the, the same chemical properties throughout. Those are going to be very, very different. Um, particularly if we're looking at the, the left versus the, the right side, there may be more similarities if we're looking at two elements that are directly next to each other. Um, but there's not going to be any consistent trend in terms of the, the similar properties going left to right. Where we are going to see similar properties, and I do like this image now because we can see red or orange, yellow, green, all of these different colors, and we're actually going to see the, the same chemical properties within these groups. So anything that's in this green group is going to behave similarly to each other. It's going to be different than this yellow group, but anything in this yellow group now, all of those elements are going to behave similarly. Um, and with these, sometimes because of that, you'll hear them referred to as families. Um, but what we're going to know them as is the, the groups. That's the term that we're going to use. Um, so the, the groups of the periodic table go up and down, and those are going to be where we see similar chemical properties. So anything that's in the, the same group is going to behave similarly. And later on, we'll see exactly why that's going to be the, the, the case. Um, and then with this, what I also want to point out is, depending on the, the periodic table you have, there's actually a couple different sort of labeling systems we have for the, the numbers, for the groups. Um, what we're going to do is just keep it simple, and we're just going to count straight across. So we're going to have, in this case, this red group would be one, orange is going to be two. This middle group in the, the center, that's got a whole bunch of them, um, we're actually going to refer to this as the, the transition metals, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, these are going to be kind of their own weird, weird large group, um, and that's why they're all just referred to as white here. Um, but these would be group, groups three, four, five, all the way up to 12. And then back here where we start to have the, the colored groups again, we'd have 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So we're going to keep it simple and just have one through 18 left to right. Um, but if you do look at a different periodic table, sometimes you'll see um, A's and B's mixed in there. Just because the, the groups that are currently colored are what, what are known as the, the main groups of the, the periodic table. So sometimes we just have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and sometimes they include a, an A or a B on there. And then the same thing with these ones. Um, this is the, the transition metals kind of have a weird set of properties. So sometimes what we'll see is one, two, three, A or three, B, four, A or four, B. Um, so sometimes you'll see the letters mixed in there too, but we're going to keep it simple and just have one through 18. And then with these groups, um, so like I talked about in the, the middle here, we've got transition metals. Um, when we actually start to look at why these elements are going to behave similarly in the, the same groups, we'll talk about why the transition metals are going to kind of be um, grouped together, even though they are 10 groups. Um, but the, the other groups we're going to want to know are just on the, the outside. So all of them have names, but the, the ones that we're going to want to know the, the names of, rather than just saying group 17 all the time, we can say halogens, um, are just going to be these two groups on both sides of the, the periodic table. Um, and if you look at it, if you can kind of just think about alphabetical order, that's the way they're going to be organized. So the, the two groups on each side of the periodic table, alkali metal versus alkaline earth starts out exactly the same. So since we've got the additional NE and then the additional even word here, um, this would come second alphabetically. And then if we go A, continue through the alphabet, eventually we'll get to H for halogen in group 17, and then continue on further, eventually we'll get to N, so noble gases, 
Um, but those are going to be the, the four groups that we, we kind of refer to by name rather than just see the number. And the, the reason for that is because these ones are going to be the ones that we kind of focus on a lot of the time um, because they're going to have sort of the, the most extreme properties because they're they're located on the sides. So they help us kind of get a better understanding of what the other elements do because these two, four groups are going to kind of be the, the extremes. Um, and you'll notice in this case, we haven't included hydrogen in this group. Um, We'll talk about that in a little bit as well. It's just going to be because hydrogen is not technically a metal. So even though it's included in this group, we don't actually consider it to be an alkali metal. Oops. Okay. Got a little bit mixed up, it looks like. Um, but just to go through some of those groups and the, the properties that they uh, exhibit, um, we're, we'll start with group 18. So all the way on the, the right-hand side, again, these are the, the noble gases. Um, sometimes they're referred to as the inert gases. So inert um, just means unreactive. And this group of the periodic table is going to be probably the, the most boring because they're not really going to do too much. Again, as we go through the actual electron sort of configuration and how the electrons are set up in these different elements, we'll understand why these ones are going to be kind of boring. Um, But because they essentially already have all the electrons they want or need, they're not going to have an interest in gaining electrons or giving up electrons. So they're essentially just going to hang out and do their own thing. And that's why helium is essentially completely unreactive. That's why if you've ever heard about the, the Hindenburg, that blimp that blew up a long time ago, um, was filled with hydrogen, which is a flammable gas. That's why it was able to uh, catch on fire. Whereas helium, what is now new, used in those blimps, um, it's going to be inert. It's not going to be reactive. It's not going to be flammable. Um, so there's not the, the potential for that type of disaster anymore. Uh, and then similarly, we'll see the, the same sort of properties throughout. So none of these are going to be very reactive. Um, in some cases, if we have very extreme situations where we've got uh, very high pressure or very high temperatures, we can get these to do um, some things. But for the, the most part, they're going to be completely unreactive. And because of that, they're, they're good in... Um, and because they're, they're gases, they're good in super cooling, uh, not super cooling, cooling superconducting magnets. Um, so a lot of the times, if you've ever gotten an MRI, they'll be running one of these gases through the, the machine to keep the, the magnets cool, make sure that they're operating properly. Um, and then, of course, you probably heard of neon lighting and things like that. So there are some uses for these, but they're going to be um, extremely unreactive. And then on the, the opposite side of the periodic table, going all the way to the left, group one, is going to be known as the, the alkali metals. Um, and again, with these, we're going to exclude hydrogen from there just because it's not going to be a metal. We'll see why exactly we include it in there because it does kind of fit with some of the, the properties, um, but we wouldn't consider it to be an alkali metal just because it's not a metal. Um, but these elements are going to be extremely, extremely reactive. We'll see ultimately that they have one valence electron and they're pretty much just dying to give it away that's gonna make them more stable. But by that, that process of giving it away is gonna make them, um, that's gonna be the, the reaction. Uh, so with these elements, we don't have them uh, in the lab at all here, but when I taught high school in New York, we did have, for whatever reason, uh, pure sodium and pure potassium. And the, the way we had to store it was actually in mineral oil because these, are, these substances are so reactive that they'll actually just react with the air and the moisture in the air and essentially just catch on fire. Um, so what we did was we had to keep it stored in mineral oil. And then what we could actually do is take a chunk of it out, throw it into a, a little, uh, or a pretty large beaker of water. Um, and then depending on the, the quantity you had, it would kind of either just for sodium kind of just fizzle around and sort of spark and just sort of swim around the, the top of the water. If you took a bigger piece, you could get like kind of a little bit of a, um, a reaction, but with the, the potassium, it was even more reactive. So by just placing that in the water, it essentially just kind of blew up. So you may have seen or you can see videos on YouTube of people that get pure uh, versions of these elements and essentially just throw it in a, a lake or a pond. Uh, you shouldn't do it just because of the, the reaction. Um, and there could be fish or something living in that, that lake or pond, so it could affect them. Um, but it does essentially just sort of give a little bit of an explosion and catch on fire that way. <laughs> 
And then there are other uses for these. So lithium, lithium ion battery, for instance, if you've heard of that. Um, potassium is used in fertilizers quite a bit. And then the atomic clock, which was used to keep track of time, um, used cesium. And with this, as we go through, I should say these properties that we're referring to are going to be the properties of these pure elements. So sodium, for instance, is going to be very reactive. It'll actually, if you just had it in your um, your hand, it would eventually just sort of catch on fire, either with the uh, su substances on your hand or just the, the substances in the, the air around it would be enough for it to react. Um, and we'll see in one of the upcoming slides, chlorine is going to be a... Um, toxic element. We don't want to be exposed to chlorine gas. Uh, but when we have something like sodium chloride, because now we're taking those pure elements and forming a new substance, we're going to have new properties entirely. So that's why sodium chloride just doesn't spontaneously blow up when it's exposed to the, the air, because it's not going to be as reactive as just pure sodium or pure chlorine. Uh, but continuing one group over, we've got the, the alkaline earth metals. So these are essentially um, sort of like the, the little brother, little sister of the group one alkali metals. They're going to be reactive and they're going to have essentially all of the same properties as those group one elements. They're just going to be less so. So they're going to be reactive, but just not quite as reactive. Um, and then with this picture over here, Marie Curie. Um, so she is, I believe, is still the only um, person to ever win a Nobel Prize in chemistry and physics. Um, but she did a lot of work with uh, radium here, as well as another element, polonium, which is going to be... What group, is it? group 16, so it's going to be on the, the opposite side of the, the periodic table. Um, but radium is actually a radioactive element, um, and they weren't too familiar with radioactivity at the, the time. So um, the, the work she did with radium along with um, her husband worked for her too. Um, the, the work that they did ultimately wound up uh, killing her. And then uh, from the, the radiation. Um, and I believe they currently have an exhibit somewhere. Uh, I would guess probably France or Poland because I believe those are the two countries she spent the, the most time in. Um, but I believe there is a, an exhibit somewhere that actually contains um, her lab materials, so like her notebook and things like that. Uh, but I think they're still um, sort of sectioned off because I think they are still slightly radioactive. And then the, the last group we'll look at, um, just the, the halogens group 17. So now we're back to the, the right-hand side of the periodic table, not quite to the, the end of it yet, um, but we're gonna see that these are also gonna be highly, highly reactive. Um, and with these, these halogens are often known as biocides, so they're lethal to, to living organisms. Um, and that's why they're often used in pesticides, so especially chlorine. I did a lot of research in grad school on pesticides, and a lot of those chemicals contain chlorine because it's going to be um, not quite as lethal as just pure diatomic chlorine, but containing those compounds containing chlorine are going to have a little bit of that effect still. Same thing with the, the remainder of these, these halogens. Um, and then somewhat related to that, because they're lethal to, to biological organisms, that makes them uh, somewhat immune to being broken down by microorganisms, which, is, which can sometimes uh, occur. And then also the, the strength of these bonds, particularly if we've got something like fluorine with carbon, um, those bonds are gonna be very, very strong. They're gonna be tough to break. So what we actually see with a lot of the, the chemicals that contain these elements um, is that they're, they're known as forever chemicals because they don't break down, they don't degrade at all, they just kind of stick around in the environment for, for a super long time. Um, so one of the, the chemicals that you may be familiar with that sort of falls into this class, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, what's known as PFAS, so per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Um, they're used in a lot of nonstick cookware, they're used in a lot of rain um, rain jackets and things like that, uh, because they have a lot of very useful properties in the sense that they're heat resistant, they're um, resistant to a whole bunch of types of degradation. Um, but because of that, they also have the, the negative consequence of basically just sticking around in the environment for, for a super long time. So these PFAS chemicals have actually started to um, increase in concentration throughout the environment. 
And now they're pretty much ubiquitous. They're pretty much everywhere throughout the, the world because they don't break down and they can also travel through the, the atmosphere. They can travel through water, um, soil even a little bit, but that's not uh, unless it's through the, the groundwater and soil. Um, but because of that, we can now measure these, con these substances pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, and then also, I forget when it was, but a while back, somebody was taking blood samples from a large collection of people and they weren't actually able to get any clean blood in the, the sense of PFAS. So every sample they took, they were finding this substance in people's blood because everybody's uh, being exposed to it. And then um, the the only way they, they found clean blood without this PFAS, uh, PFAS types of chemicals um, was by going to some branch of the military had um, blood samples stored on ice from decades ago. So they were able to, to look at some of that blood and find clean samples. Um, but it's likely that uh, everybody on earth probably has some amount of PFAS in their, their blood now at this point, um, because now they're even finding it in the, the rainwater uh, pretty much everywhere in the world. So that's going to be one of the uh, examples of chemistry sort of having a negative consequence. And we'll see that uh, with a few other chemicals as well. But with these, I want to point out is the, the pure element version of them isn't just going to be one single fluorine atom or one chlorine atom, one bromine. It's always going to be the, the diatomic version. So if we have just fluorine or just chlorine, we'll always have two of those atoms together. Similar to, to oxygen or nitrogen, the, the, the gas, um, those gases, hydrogen as well, we'll have the, the diatomic version of all of those. And then with this, this kind of just gives us a textbook definition of what we were talking about. So again, we were talking about the, the arrangement of the periodic table. It's arranged so that the atomic number is increasing and so that we see the, the same properties repeat within a given group. So going up and down, we see uh, those elements are gonna have similar properties as one another. That's just what's referred to as periodic law. So any group in the, the periodic table, the elements within that group, are going to behave similarly to one another. So if you look at, for instance, group 16, something we haven't talked, one of the groups we haven't talked about, the, the oxygen family, we'd expect oxygen and sulfur to have similar chemical properties because those are in the, in the same group going up and down. Whereas nitrogen and oxygen are right next to each other going left and right. In that case, we wouldn't expect them to behave similarly. So the, the periodic law is just referring to the, the groups going up and down. We see similar chemical properties within the elements in those. Um, so here, if you want, take a second to kind of, and you'll, you'll want to get your, your periodic table ready if you haven't already. Um, but just pause this video, see if you can kind of use the, the information given here. So in some cases, we're given just the, the group and the period number. In other cases, we're given the period with the, the group name itself rather than the, the number. Um, so see if you can take these five pieces of information and identify what those five elements are going to be. Uh, but I'm just going to continue with this. So if we look at the, the first one, group four, period five, again, remember groups go up and down, periods go left to right. So in this case, if we're looking at group four, we're going to be looking at the, the group that contains titanium, zirconium, hafnium, and rutherfordium. But if we're looking at the, the fifth period, group four kind of already starts at period four. So we just want to make sure that we're looking at the, the, the numbers on the, the side or the number on the top correctly. Because um, for, for the first one, we should just wind up with zirconium. Continuing with the, the second one, group 16. This one is going to be also kind of easy to, to mix up because if we look at group 16, period two, it's easy to just find group 16, look at the, the oxygen family. So oxygen's at the top there and then see period two, just go down to the, the second element in that group. But note that the, the first period only contains hydrogen and helium on the, the very ends. So what we're gonna be looking at um, in this case is actually just oxygen. So it's easy to kind of mix that one up because if you see period two, you're gonna look at that group, go down to the, the second element. But period two is actually gonna be the, the top um, the top of groups 2, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. 
continuing on. Um, so period three, we know we're looking at the, the third row of the, the periodic table. So we know we're dealing with sodium, magnesium, um, or continuing on to the, the right-hand side, something like aluminum through argon. But now that it tells us the, the halogen, we know specifically which group of that period we're looking at. Um, so we're looking at the, the 17th group. And again, it's still that third, third period. So we're just going to be looking at chlorine in that case. Same thing with the, the next one. In this case, we're told the, the, the group first of so the alkali earth metal. And actually, that should be alkaline. Um, so it should have the, the NE there. But if we're looking at the, the fourth period, that would be calcium. And then continuing with the, the final one, group 17, period two. Again, we just want to recognize that for group 17, period two is going to be the, the top element in that one because there's nothing in period one for group 17. Uh, so we would just be looking at fluorine, similar to uh, the, the second example where we're looking at oxygen, just one group over. Um, so now looking at these elements, if we wanted to think about which of them is going to have the most similar chemical properties to one another, we want to think about the, the periodic law. We want to think about what that represents. And we want to look to see where these elements are located in, with respect to one another. And with it, we've got a couple choices. Zirconium and calcium are kind of on their own. They're not really near anything. They're not in the same group or the same period as any of these other elements. Um, but oxygen, chlorine, and fluorine are all near the sort of the, the top right of the periodic table. Oxygen is to the, the left of fluorine. Chlorine is just underneath fluorine. Um, and again, we want to recognize that we're going to see similar properties within these groups. So we're going to have similar properties for fluorine and chlorine. Even though oxygen is to the, the left of fluorine, just one over, we don't see the, the similar chemical properties repeat as we go left to right. We only see them repeat going up and down. So that's why we would say fluorine and chlorine are going to be chemically similar. Um, but none of these other elements will be. And then with the, the periodic table itself, um, we've got a couple other ways we can kind of break it down. So rather than the, the groups, we've got different types of elements. Um, so metal versus non-metal. And then metalloid is going to be essentially just an average of these two. It's going to act a little bit like a metal. It's going to act a little bit like a non-metal. Um, so it doesn't really fall neatly into one of these categories. Uh, and when we're looking at the, the periodic table, if you have it in front of you, you can kind of see, if you look at boron in group 13, Underneath it, it's got kind of a dark, uh, a bold line. And then we've got kind of a weird staircase with that bold line continuing all the way down to the right. So it cuts through aluminum and silicon, gallium and germanium, tin and antimony, bismuth and polonium, kind of continues all the way through there. That's what we're going to refer to as the, the staircase. So if we look here, this jagged um, bold line is what we're referring to as the, the staircase. Anything to the left of that, is going to be a metal with the exception of hydrogen. So at the, the top right, hydrogen is going to be the only uh, non-metal to the left of this staircase. To the, the right of it, we're going to have our non-metals. So that's what we're seeing in kind of this I don't know, gold or bronze color, whatever you want to call that. Um, but in between the two, like I said, the, the metalloids are sort of a, a mix, sort of an average of these two groups. That's why we actually see them located in between. The, the metals and the non-metals. Um, and like I said, their, their properties are going to be kind of in between a metal and a non-metal. Um, we'll see those properties in a second. But with this, um, I'm not going to be too focused on which of these elements are we considering a metalloid, which is going to be a non-metal, which is a metal in terms of this general area. Like I would never ask, is bismuth or antimony uh, a metal or a non-metal metalloid, um, just because on the staircase, it's a little ambiguous. And then I didn't include it here, but depending on what graph you actually look at, you can sometimes see um, slight differences in what's considered a metalloid versus what's considered a metal or a non-metal for some of these. So what we want to do is just recognize that the staircase is kind of the divider between metals on the left, non-metals on the right. Of course, hydrogen will be that exception. Um, and then the, the staircase itself is kind of where the, the metalloids are located. Um, so don't worry too much about which of these specifically is a metal or a non-metal. 
Um, but generally anything touching the staircase in any way on the, the right hand side will be considered a, a metalloid. The only real exception is carbon, if you look. So it's kind of touching that, that line, but we're going to consider carbon to be a non-metal, whereas everything else on the other right hand side, um, we do consider to be a metalloid, I should say. And then quickly to just go through some of these properties. Um, you're probably familiar with some of these, even if you're not um, explicitly familiar with them. So things like metal, you're probably sure that are shiny. Um, if you think about cooking with different pieces of cookware, when you put a, a metal in the oven, the entire thing's gonna heat up because it's a good conductor. Um, metals are gonna be solids at room temperature. Obviously we can heat them up into to molten metal, into liquids, but at room temperature, they're gonna be solids. Um, and then with these ones, you may not be familiar with these terms, malleable and ductile, um, essentially just mean that they can be either hammered into sheets or sort of um, fashioned into to wires. So if you think about just electric wires um, or just the, the sheets that you cook with, since they're able to be sort of fashioned into those pretty easily, that's why we're considering them to be malleable and ductile. Whereas the, the non-metals, um, in this case, we can actually have a, a mix of those different states. So if we go back to this periodic table, things like oxygen, nitrogen, uh, fluorine, chlorine, those are going to be gases at room temperature. The inert gases, of course, are going to be gases as well. Um, but things like carbon uh, is going to be a solid at room temperature. Bromine is actually going to be the one liquid at room temperature. Um, but we can have a mix of those states of matter. And with these nonmetals, when they are in the, the solid form, so something like sulfur, if you've ever dealt with that, is just sort of a, a, a yellow, um, sort of crusty, powdery substance uh, because it's going to be brittle. And then because of that, we won't be able to, to fashion it into sheets, to fashion it into to wires. So it's going to be non-malleable. It's not going to be ductile. Um, and these non-metals are going to be poor conductors. So if you think about something like um, a, a wood spoon, if you have that above your, your pot of boiling water, of course, the, the pot itself is going to heat up because it's metal. But if you've got the, the spoon kind of just laying on the, the edge of it, if it's a wooden spoon, it's not going to be a good conductor because it's a non-metal. It's not going to heat up very much. Um, and then I should also point out, so I said bromine is a liquid at room temperature. There is one uh, metal that's a liquid at room temperature, and that's just going to be considered mercury. We go back here, um, gallium which uh, we're considering a metal here. Sometimes I've seen people consider it a, a non-metal, uh, but typically it is considered, or a metalloid, I should say. Typically it is considered a metal though. Um, but in addition to mercury, in addition to bromine, so mercury may be familiar with from some of the, the thermometers include mercury. Um, but with the, the gallium, that's gonna be a solid, but it's actually gonna have a very, very low boiling point or melting point, excuse me. Um, so if you've ever heard of the, the book, The Disappearing Spoon, um, it's just a book that goes into a whole bunch of interesting stories about different elements. So if you think that's something you're, you're interested in, let me know, because I do have a copy of that book I can lend out. Um, but the, the title story, The Disappearing Spoon, is based on gallium. Um, it's a solid, but it's got a very low melting point. So what you can actually do is, um, since it is malleable and ductile, you can kind of take a sample of gallium and shape it into a spoon. But what's going to happen is, uh, or what you can do is then give that spoon to somebody that's drinking coffee or drinking tea, drinking some sort of hot beverage that they're going to mix something with and need to stir um, so that they add the, the sugar, add the milk, whatever it is to their, their coffee, um, and then stir the, the drink around with that gallium spoon. But because the, the coffee is going to be above the, the melting point of gallium, it's actually just going to melt and turn into to silver, or not silver, turn into a liquid. Um, and then the, the person stirring it is eventually just going to kind of lose that spoon entirely and not really know what's going on. Um, so that's one of the, the, that's the main story or the, the title story, I should say, in The Disappearing Spoon. Um, but then they've got a whole bunch of other stories related to the different elements and some of the, the interesting things in history that have been um, either achieved with them or what they were used for. Uh, so if you are interested in that book, just let me know and I'm happy to lend that out to anybody. And then this is where we're going to stop. Um, this is going to lead into the, the second portion of this chapter where we actually look at the exact electron configuration. So that's what we're showing here with the, the 2s1, 2s2, 
um, things like that. These are going to refer to the, the different locations and the different energies of specific electrons. But what I want to point out here, just to, to hammer home the, the periodic law concept, is if we look and go down any of these groups, we have exactly the same thing. So if you pick any of these groups with the exception of just this first period, so we got 1s2, 2p6. So this is going to be kind of a, a special case. But if we go down the, the alkali metals, 2s1, 3s1, 4s1, the first number we're going to learn is just essentially the, the energy level. But the, the second piece here, the letter, and then the, the superscript is going to be referring to sort of the, I don't want to say the type of electron, um, but it's going to be referring to the, the specific location, specific energy of that electron. So when we look down any of these uh, elements in the, the first group, the reason they're all going to behave similarly is because they all have that S1 electron. We move one group over, S2 all the way down. So we're changing the, the energy level, but the electron itself is going to be very similar. That's why we're seeing similar chemical properties. And the same thing with any of these other groups. So 3D10, 4D10, 5D10, 6D10. We still have the, the D10 piece. Um, same thing with the, the halogens, P5, noble gases, with the exception of this first one, are P6. Um, so in the, the second portion of this, we'll get a better understanding. We'll actually break down what the, the energy level is, what the, the different letters represent, what the, the superscript is, um, and kind of piece all those together. Uh, but this just shows why we're going to see the same chemical properties within these groups. They're going to have very similar electron configurations, which is going to be um, what determines their chemical properties.